Hey guys, we have my friend Dan Harris here. Uh, Dan, you guys know from ABC's weekend edition of Good Morning American. Yes. Good Morning American. And then we have um, and then the host of Nightline. Yes. Uh, and the author of a book called uh, uh, Ten Minutes in Ecstasy. No, it's called... Um, <laughs> What's your book called? Fifty Shades of Meditation. <laughs> it's called, uh, well, I wrote two, but the new one's called Meditation for Fidgety Skeptics. I love that. I love that. Now, did you meditate this morning? Yes. So do you do it in the morning? I do it whenever I can, wherever I can. Yes. Like, I have no rules. No rules about it. No. And now this, um, we're getting, say both of the names of the book so people can get them on Amazon. The first book was called 10% Happier. That's it. Yes. And the other one is called? Meditation for Fidgety Skeptics. Yeah. When did you find time to write these books? Uh, the first book took me five years to do, and it was a whole long struggle, and I had to learn how to write while writing. Uh, the second book, I crashed it in a year, and it nearly killed me. But I had some co-authors, uh, this meditation teacher named Jeff Warren. Mm. He and I did the book together. Oh, that's lovely. Yeah. yeah. Same publisher? Different publisher. Huh. What was your experience? We don't want to name names or anything. How was your experience with the first publisher? Do you think they did a good job with it? I think there were parts they did really well and parts where I got a little frustrated. Yeah. But I learned subsequently that it's very hard to find an author who hasn't dealt with what they believe to be traumatic experiences vis-a-vis -vis their publisher. Oh yeah, I mean you know, I mean you're in the you're in the business you're in the business of communicating. You know what it's like with these big companies. I'm assuming it was one of the big companies that did your first book. Mm -hmm. You know, and you went on to another big company for your second book. Yes, but not, <laughs> I didn't leave because I had some sort of negative experience with them. I left beca really because somebody else just made a better offer. Uh huh. Sure. Why not? Yes, it's, I'm a capitalist. Yeah. Why not? Um, so, you know, Dan Harris, you interviewed me, I think it was a little over a year ago. Yes. That was, we had fun. We had a lot of fun. It was a lot of fun. And I, I'm always. It's funny, I was arguing with my, my wife, Bianca. Who's here with yes. us right now. I was arguing with her on the way, not arguing, but we're debating. She said, she said, um, well, it'll be fun because you guys already did this interview together. I was like, he meets a million people. He's not going to remember. What? But you did remember, so. No, I, you know, you know I, unfortunately, I remember everything unfortunately, which is not a good, because, you know, you do this thing for so long, and I, I hold grudges. That's why med we're going to talk about meditation and, and being able to release some of that stuff, okay. too, because, uh, you know, uh, it's unfortunate. I wish I could forget some of the interviews I've done, you know? But this was just a, this was a little over a year ago, maybe, yes. yeah. something like yeah. that. It was really fun. We had a, really fun. A, a great time. I played, we did a piece on you for Nightline and then also on my podcast, so yes. That's right. Yeah. What's the name of your podcast? Ten Percent Happier. Ten Percent Happier, and you can you can uh, find that on SoundCloud and iTunes Everywhere. and all those places. Yeah. You were one of my first podcast guests. Really? Yeah. Um, what uh, the podcast? When do you find time to to do that? Because you work you in, you're in the high pressure business of news, which is rolling out all the time. Yes. When do you find the time to do a book or, uh, you know, play with your kid or uh, you have two kids? One. We have a three-year-old. When do you have time to do all this it's stuff? The time is, I would say, one of the – probably the biggest issue in my life of figuring out how to get everything done that I want to get done. It's just right. a, every day I just kind of figure out how I, you know, how I can do everything I need to do. It's a. It's very, very tricky. Well, you've done a lot. I mean, you're you're, you're a young person, and I'm you've done a that, lot I'm not in that your. Young. How old? How old are you? I'm forty six. Forty six. I think that's young. You do? Yeah. You know, I was I was watching the Golden Girls this morning, and they were they were saying, "Oh, Dorothy, you're fifty years old." I'm going, "She's young, my Wait, God." Tell tell me how what, what what kind of morning would you have where the Golden Girls would be on? Well, I went to bed. Well, first of all, it's on Hulu, so you can watch it on demand. Okay. But I went to Question bed. Question still holds. Yeah, <laughs> I went to bed. I think at nine o'clock, or maybe it was eight thirty, mm -hmm. maybe. And I woke up at two in the morning. Whoa. Yeah. And so. Happily or unhappily? No, happily. Happily okay. at two. Um, I, you know, I just follow what my body wants to do. Normally, I would get up, um, stretch and uh, pray. I'm not religious. I pray. I say I, every time I say I pray, I have to. I Every time I say I'm not religious because I don't want. I guess I don't want people to get the impression that I'm perhaps praying to the God that they're praying to. <laughs> 
<laughs> you know, then um, after I'm while I'm down there, why not? And then uh, <laughs> and then I'll I'll meditate then. And this morning I only did, you know, five minutes. That's good. You know, five minutes is good. But um, before I did that, I had a, you normally I get up at four. I had a couple of hours, got up at two. So that's when I watched the Golden Girls. You were just like, I got time. What I want to watch in the whole universe of entertainment, I'm going for the gold. I'm going because it delivers every single time. And also, before you got here today, we had one of the writer producers of that show uh, sitting in that very seat. And um, it's not even that I needed to, you know. Ac- reacclimate myself because I'm always watching the Golden Girls. When's the la- Dan, when's the last time you watched the Golden Girls? Well, you're pointing out that there's a big hole in my cultural literacy. Uh, clearly. I'm, I'm not, I mean, I'm, I'm familiar with the genre, I mean, with the show, but I, I haven't watched it in a long time. What are you doing with your life? Well, I don't know. That's a good question. Have you ever seen the Golden Girls? Yes, of course. Would you, okay, uh, in your memory, yes. What was? what's your memory of the Golden Girls? Do you remember an episode or what happened or Tell me what, when I say Golden Girls, what comes up for you? I just see images of women, uh, seniors, saying funny things to each other. Was it B. Arthur who was also in it? B. Arthur, Betty White, uh, Estelle Getty, Rue McClanahan. uh, It was fabulous. But that's not in your your, your, uh, Hulu queue. No. No, definitely not. What is in your Hulu clue? Well, uh, I loved uh, on Hulu specifically *Handmaid's Tale*. I thought uh-huh. it was really, was great. really good, especially yeah, great. right now. Oh yeah, definitely. Well, see, but you know you, that you're not escaping. I mean, you're you're in the news business. You have to. I remember once I was in a newsroom for. Uh, uh, it may have been ABC for a long time. It was on Groundhog's Day, and they had this wall of televisions, of televisions from all over the U.S., maybe over over the world. And it was so funny because all these news, these televisions, different people, different images saying, "Today, uh, Fox Afani Phil Groundhog's Day." It was, it was the same old thing. It was, <laughs> and now that one's saying, uh, "Groundhog's Day, Fox Afani Phil." How do you say that guy's name? Punxsutawney Phil. Punxsutawney Phil. <laughs> and you think. <laughs> Oh my God, this is maddening. It is maddening. You're in this business. You're you're part of that thing. Yeah. Uh, you know, but you would watch ha- Handmaid's Tale, which is it's still kind of that same kind of, what about mindless stuff? When do you want to do some, because mind- Handmaid's Tale is not mindless. It's, no. It's heavy. It's heavy, but it's still escapist for me because you're being pulled into another world, an imaginative world, and it's a narrative that you're following, and you kind of surrender your own little dramas and stories in your own life. And so I find it, I really love watching narrative television, scripted or unscripted. If it can take me somewhere else and put me in somebody else's shoes, I'm in. Yeah, because I'm, and I'm, I guess I said all that because you seem like a very serious-minded feller. Oh no, 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 no! I mean, you should, if, if if we handed my wife the microphone, I'm I'm a complete uh, bozo, lots of the time. Okay, so what would what would what would could we find out about you that we'd really be surprised about? Like, what television show is your favorite TV show of all time? Chappelle Show. Really? Without hesitation. Right. I think it's the most brilliant TV show that's ever been made. What makes it brilliant? Second only to RuPaul's Drag Race. Of course, yes. I, I, that goes without saying. Yes. Wh- what makes the Chappelle show brilliant? He is brilliant, and he had an incredible team of writers. Dave Brennan, who I believe was the, the executive producer of the show. Mm-hmm. I could be getting his title wrong. Mm-hmm. Uh, and they were so topical for the time, too. They were mm-hmm. taking on the Bush administration, the war in Iraq. They were taking on racism. Mm-hmm. Uh, they were uh, the... the uh, archetypal sort of iconic um prince skit that yeah. they did uh, yeah. um they they rick did, james rick james that i can go back now and watch those episodes and still laugh hysterically <laughs> even though i can recite the jokes in advance i just think he is a special guy and uh there was an amazing team there uh both on screen and off that produced incredibly funny stuff silly all the stuff about the wu-tang clan uh it was just great <laughs> What do you think that says about you that you that you love the show? What is it specifically that it appeals to? You? What does that say about you? I like I really like silly humor if it's smart. Uh-huh. And Chappelle is, in my view, probably a genius. I mean, I've never met the uh-huh. the man, but uh-huh. he strikes me as a genius. And so we had this combination of really edgy humor with just ridiculousness and yeah. that mix is really potent i think 
Yeah. It's funny. Uh, I saw a news report uh, of you uh, and you bring up the Chappelle show. You talk about the skit he does where he's talking to this guy about business, but he's thinking his mind wanders into all of these yes. uh, other yes. these yeah. other things. That is actually the gr he did the best kind of visual exploration of what our minds are like. So he's at dinner in L.A. and he's having dinner, I think, with his wife and some obnoxious executive comes up butts into the dinner and starts pitching him a bunch of ideas for shows. Yeah. And they pan back and they have a thought bubble in Dave's head and he's got all these random things <laughs> coming up. I think Arsenio Hall at a party punching something in the face because he they didn't tell him how good the cheese plate was. Just like random stuff. He's dancing around in a black sheep outfit. And it's really, really funny stuff. And that is how our minds work. Yeah. Uh, we're sitting here having a conversation and it's possible that you're thinking about, you know, what's for lunch or yeah. any number of ridiculous things while I'm talking because that's just the way the mind works. Meditation helps you see that the, that's the way your mind works and therefore not be so dragged around by it. Right, right. So now, um, speaking on that, some, you know, I told you I, I meditate this morning for five minutes. Sometimes I, I usually never go for more than 15 minutes, you know, but uh, why is that important? Why is meditation important? Even if it is just a minute, five minutes, why is that important? So I'm of the view that a minute absolutely counts. Why is it important? Two big reasons. One, you're training your brain to focus. So basic meditation works like this. You sit, eyes closed, you can keep them open if you want. Uh, you sit in a comfortable position. It doesn't have to be uh, cross-legged. You can do it if you want. I'm not limber enough to do that. Second step is, and there are only three steps, the second step is to bring your full attention to the feeling of your breath coming in and going out. There are, let me just interrupt this to say there are millions of kinds sure. of meditation, but what I'm describing is basic mindfulness meditation. Yeah. The second step is to bring your full attention to the feeling of your breath coming in and going out. You pick a spot where it's most prominent, like your nose or your chest or your belly. And then the third step is, as soon as you try to do this, your mind's going to go nuts. You know, why did I miss season, season 17 of RuPaul's Drag Race? Yeah. Where do gerbils run wild? You know, <laughs> blah, blah, blah. <laughs> the whole game is just to notice, oh, I got distracted, yeah. and to start again yeah. and again and again. And every time you do, that is a bicep curl for your brain. And it shows mm -hmm. up on the brain scans. Also, it is a radical act. You are breaking a lifetime's habit of walking around in a fog of rumination and mm -hmm. pr projection and self-absorption, and you're actually just focusing on what's happening right now. So every time you notice you become distracted and start again, two big benefits accrue. One is you are training your brain to focus we live in an era of just like it's been called the info blitzkrieg mm -hmm. texts tweets status updates constantly hitting us and so the brain has gotten very distractible the mind has become very distractible meditation hacks that mm -hmm. and uh the second benefit is an even bigger one which is it's sometimes called mindfulness it's the ability to see what's happening in your head without getting carried away by it. Mm -hmm. When you see that you become distracted, usually it's by some random thinking or it's by a strong emotion like anger, jealousy, um, gas, sadness, gas, gassiness. Yeah. Uh, and then when you see though that emotion or physical sensation clearly, it doesn't own you as much. So when sadness hits you in your, the rest of your life or anger hits you in the rest of your life, you can realize what is happening so that you aren't owned by it, so that you aren't yanked around by it. That is a game-changing skill, and it can be developed in a minute, five minutes, 15 minutes, whatever you want. Yeah, you're absolutely right. And it's, it's just interesting, the concept of being able to see yourself from outside of yourself, because then you, you're you able to see your thoughts as just as as just thoughts. They're not really real even your feelings to a certain degree you know aren't even really real that's right they're you know? little more than nothing yeah uh, they the th a thought which is w unobserved a thought is like a little dictator in the mind mm -hmm. telling you what to do and we obey it yeah. because we have not woken up to the fact that we're having this non-stop conversation with ourselves but yeah. when you see thoughts for what they are just little quantum bursts of energy that have no real substance and may actually have no connection to reality when you see them for what they are then you've got a shot at not obeying the the sort of shitty idea machine that is yeah. your ego yeah oh my goodness you know i i'm just trying to think back to when i w became aware of that but i think that through movies and television um the concept of this was always there i i, I you know what i intellectualized it but i didn't hadn't put it into 
my emotional life until much later. You know, I think having lived my life as as a wake and bake stoner for so many years. <laughs> Real, really, Tr true story. Uh, oh, honey. So into oh. your into your adult life. Oh, I started smoking weed when I was ten, and then I quit when I was thirty nine. So it was like almost thirty years. Yeah. Of, and and when I say That's wake dedication. and bake, I mean wake and bake. You mean like bong hit? I mean from the time I woke up. To the time I laid my head down, I oh, was stoned, okay. stoned, and but it was a different culture then. It was, you know, I don't know. I guess it's that culture is returning. But see, I always and I experiment with a few other things too. Um, so I was always able to. There was a separation between my thoughts, and I could always kind of look down at myself and go not look down at myself, but see myself from outside of myself. Well, I mean, weed is good for that. Yeah, yeah, but you know. Too much weed is a whole nother story. Too much of anything. Yeah, yeah. Hey, By the way, no judgment here. You're talking to a guy who used to have a coke problem. So it's no, I, I get it. Yeah. You know, I think it's important. I think it's important to to uh, to explore different states of consciousness. And I think that's why meditation. You know, what's interesting about the meditation is that having done hallucinogens and other things um, sort of showed me the path to get to that place that I get to with meditation obviously i don't need drugs to get there now in fact you're one two three step there that's it it's as simple as that yeah yeah but um you know Look, for, for time immemorial from the shamans in the in the jungles to uh all, different cultures all over the world people have used substances to transport themselves into different states of consciousness mm -hmm. they can be used in an abusive and unhealthy way as we've seen as the your wake and bake which actually was wake bake not stop baking until you go to bed yeah so it wasn't just waking and baking it was being baked every time you were awake yeah. um that is an abuse of of the substance but the substance in and of itself can have salutary effects sure sure hey we've got dan harris here um you're going to tell me the name of the book that one is um i, I get to i see the letter 10 i, I see the number 10, 10 minutes in ecstasy 10 what's minutes in, in in heaven <laughs> um what's the the first one from oh um 14 is what 10 percent happier 10 percent happier 10 percent happier and the new book is called meditation for fidgety skeptics meditation for fidgety skeptic see i have to see it written down i have to see no, i have to see it in my head yeah you know so it did we not to... send you books we should have sent you books. no 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 you didn't send me books but i'm i can't wait to to read these books um we're gonna take a break and okay. we'll be right back after right. this Girl, I'm going to talk to you about pureformen.com, honey. Tell me all about well, it. Well, it's really an interesting concept because this is something that prepares a man for anal sex. There, okay. I said it. And Boom. you should say it because it is what it is. That's what it is. And now, you do have to prepare. I'm going to say there's a lot of women or girls listening that are like, what are you talking about? Yeah. You just need to know that when boys do this, and by the way, when women do it as exactly. well, you need to prepare so things don't get messy. That's right. You know, because you know, in the movies, everybody, you know, they wake up and they kiss and they have morning breath and, you know, they, it, you know, everybody ha is in the throes of passion and they immediately go into stuff. It's like, I'm sorry, you have to prepare for everything. It's not the real world. It's exactly right. And that's why pure for men is such a beautiful beautiful concept it's an all-natural men's cleanliness supplement that allows you to bottom <laughs> through any situation and i love that it's natural i love that it's a proprietary blend it's a fiber blend it has chia flaxseed and psyllium husk and it's even vegan friendly hi, hey sisters vegan. hi and rue it works like a sponge to clean your digestive system so that when you go you actually really go and nothing's left behind because a lot of times we talk about this with squatty potty you don't get the proper that's right stuff. evacuation correct yes Yes. Elimination. Elimination. And girl, you know they have one for women too. What? Yes, it's pure for her. Okay. It's slightly different. It has, a, it's a smaller capsule okay. and it includes aloe vera. I would assume that all of our intestines and stuff are the same. Uh-huh. I would assume I could just take for him too. And then there, there's, there's some big women's out there too that That's might want to take the man's version. I don't want no and dates. there's some petite little <laughs> men out there who might want to take the lady version. <laughs> Go to pureformen.com and use the offer code RU to get 20% off your first order. So keep your runway clear for landing and hey. bottom with confidence with Pure for Men. That's pureformen.com. Offer code RU. That's right. Fly the Pure for Men airline. <laughs> 
Squarespace. Squarespace is the company that has revolutionized the act of creating your own website, which I believe everybody should have. If you are in this world, you need people to know where you are and, and what you're about. And Squarespace is here to help you do that. You know what, Rue? Um, I You got these really cute business cards and I copied mm -hmm. the same one. I'll show you mine. Okay. And I got one too. And all I put on it was my website. Good. Good. Because yeah. that's the new calling that's card. That's how people find you. And they also get a taste of your aesthetic and, and your value system. And I think it's important to do that. That's why Squarespace is so important. Exactly. Making a website has never been easier. You can make that gorgeous website in minutes using their beautiful templates. And really easy. That drag and drop platform that we talk about is so easy. And when you're ready to purchase a plan, get 10% off with the offer code RU. That's squarespace.com, offer code RU. We've got Dan Harris here. We're talking about meditation, and all kinds of things. You know, you've been on television as a broadcaster, journalist, even on the front lines of wars for years and years and years. Um, and that's all important stuff. But I just want to know how you're able to talk like like a broadcaster. Did you go to school to learn how to do that? No, I guess I must be a sociopath because I just picked it up really easily. I don't uh, there is no school. You didn't well, cultivate this voice. No, my, here's proof that I didn't. My younger brother has an indistinguishable voice from me. Our wives and our parents cannot tell us apart. Uh -huh. So I didn't cultivate the, the, the depth of the voice. Yeah. But there there is like a culture in TV news sure. th where we do talk a certain way. Yeah. And I think I just slipped right into yeah. it. I don't like it. I, I try to train myself to be more conversational. Uh -huh. But it's, I mean, I've been doing... I've been anchoring the news since I was 21. Wow. So that's a long time. Yeah. Yeah. I, you know, I, I speak on television and there are times when I try to talk like a newscaster. There are times when I'm describing something and I fall into this thing where, and I got this from doing radio, is I will use my hands to dictate how, I'm doing it right now, by the way, you can't see me doing this. Um, <laughs> how to pace myself because if i had a mind i would talk really fast like this if i didn't do it or not. but to pace myself i will use my hand like a conductor for an orchestra i will so when i on the radio i would do that but on television i don't do the conductor thing i end up moving my head in this way to where i'm at, <laughs> for people who are listening at home i'm doing this thing that um trixie does when trixie does an impersonation of me she does a thing where she moves her head for Every word like that. Anyway, <laughs> long story long is how are you? How do you do that talk without doing the things that I'm, I'm without physicalizing it by standing still and doing? Because that's what I want to do. A lot of practice. I think I for many years did do a lot of gesticulation, and I do some gesticulation. See, had I gone to college, I'd know that word gesticulation it sounds kind of dirty it does it um, does so okay so you you started you did a lot of gesticulation yeah. yes. before and i would hold a pen in my hand which often came off as a little sort of bob dole-esque yeah. uh -huh. and and actually bianca uh, my wife talked to me and pointed both of these things out to me uh. and i've over time the reason over time you just get better by watching yourself, sure, which is yeah. painful to yes. watch yourself, at least for me. Yeah. Um, and you see what you're doing that might be a little weird and off putting. Right. Also, Twitter's very useful because Twitter people feel free all the time to tell me whenever I'm a bonehead on Twitter, mm -hmm. and and sometimes it's actually quite useful, even if it's painful to hear. Oh, I've got so what? So to walk me through you reading tweets about yourself. Do you have your life coach with you when you read these tweets? I don't have a life coach. I will tell you, recently I got a tweet that was really mean and said something to the effect, I don't remember the exact wording, but it said, you, you're talking about yourself too much. And I was like, you're right. It was, uh, I was on Good Morning America over mm -hmm. the holidays. I was mm -hmm. filling in every day, and I was kind of personalizing many of the stories, and mm -hmm. I realized, oh, yeah. I don't need to do that so much. Mm, I can talk. Mm. I can be chatty with my co-host, but I don't need mm. to make it about me. And so sometimes the things that come over the transom on Twitter are... Um, uh, Informative. Yeah. Sometimes they're just incredibly hilarious and yeah. mean. But also, did you find that reading Twitter, even emails, remember years ago when emails became a thing, uh, that, that you could read between the lines. You could you could sense the rhythm of of the, the language there and read... 
get information in between the lines. Yes. And some certain tweets, you can tell if this person is a fucking idiot <laughs> and that you don't need to listen to them. And then there are times when you think, you know what? Huh. This may be something I need to hear. Yeah, punctuation, spelling, and grammar often can do that for you. Yes, definitely. You know, the other day I saw a film uh, about millennials, and they used the question mark inflection throughout the film. And I, I could barely hear, you know, a quarter of the way through, um, I, I kind of had to s stop the movie and take a breather. And just go back to the Golden Girls. I, I just go back to the Golden Girls. But I can <laughs> only imagine for a broadcaster like you wh who is very conscious of the the melody of your speak to be really turned off by the question mark inflection you mean abuse. ending every sentence with One it. time at band camp, I went to the store and I was like, oh, stop it, please stop. And what, is, what do you think that is? You know, young women... Uh, especially in California, have gone, have made a meal out of this. I have my theories about this. Do you? Is this something you think about, Dan? I think it's, though, it's not just millennials. It's young people always. When I was young, I, I used the word like a ton. Sure. And um, remember there was that whole thing of the, making fun of how uh, a Valley Girl spoke. Yes. Remember that whole song? Yes. Was it Dweezil Zappa or yes. Moon Unit Zappa? Yeah. Um, so I just think as young people have weird ways of speaking. And as we get older, we become less tolerant of that. Yeah, but, you know, the, our whole culture – is doing it now. In fact, like this movie I saw the other day, the all of the dialogue is spoken that way. I think I think that young people don't want to commit themselves to a point of view and that they are put every line, every word they speak is a disclaimer. And it's like you, so I need you to say agree with me that one time at band camp, I need I need you to prove of what I just said that you understood it. You know, that's why I use the question mark inflection. What do you call it? What do you broadcasters call? I call it the question mark inflection. I, I have never heard a better term. I like yeah. that term. Uh, Would you think it's in some way linked to political correctness? I think so. I think they don't want to commit to it. Because, you know, at, at Starbucks or at some store, some barista will say, you know, there's a line, there's a queue. And they'll say, um, I'll take the next person in line. It's like, motherfucker, I'm the next. You see I'm the next one in line. Just say, look at me and say, sir, I'll take you next. They don't want to commit to, they may make a mistake. You follow what I'm saying? They don't want, and it happens. It's like, don't say, I'll take the next person. It's like, motherfucker, it's me. Do you say that? You ever let loose? Someone? I don't. You know, because for the same reason, I don't want to get involved with this person. I don't want to have a dialogue with them. So I keep it broad. Does that make sense to you guys what I'm saying? And I think that's what they're doing. They keep it broad because they don't want to make it personal. You follow what I'm saying? I do. So uh, I think the question mark inflection is part of it. I think the vocal fry is part of it. Vocal fry? The vocal fry is where oh, that, you know, yeah, I yeah, went yeah, to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, because it's, it's non-committal. It's saying... Vocal, what is vocal fry saying? What do you what's your what do you think psychologically? Like here's speaking. I hear it as dissociation. I'm just not connected to whatever's happening yes. right now. Yeah, I'm not in. I'm not invested in yes. a way where I can be sued or called out on it. I'm over it. You know what I'm saying? It's it, ironic. Like if I commit to something, I can be made fun for. Yes. Fun of it, whereas, yes. Yes. Yeah, and I think that's where we are today. I think that's what's happening. You think it's not just the way young people have always been, you think it's actually broader societal issues? I think so. I think because more people, um, uh, uh, women, especially in our culture, are doing not only vocal fry, but the question mark inflection. And I think it's, I think it's kind of an apology. Because we're also careful around each other. We're very careful around each other. You know, I, um, I, only, I only talk about this because on television, you cannot talk that way. I, I'm, I'm just wondering yeah. if it does it bother you when you watch movies and and the people are doing this. No, I feel. I mean, uh, it, it will now. Th uh -huh. Thank you for that. <laughs> but I, I haven't really noticed it the way you have. I've got lots of you know things that bug me, but that one will now be on my list, but hasn't heretofore. But you know, part of mindfulness is actually paying attention to everything. I would think yes, that you right. would be paying attention to. Every single thing that goes by, like you, I bet you could tell me how many people 
have walked by this window right you here. You vastly overestimate my really? mindfulness. Yeah. I mean, oh. I mean, I'm, uh, although I have to say when I'm being interviewed or when I'm doing an interview, what I've gotten much better at is paying attention mm-hmm. and not doing the Dave Chappelle thing of you know, uh-huh. thinking about Arsenio Hall at a cocktail party. Yeah. Where I, so generally speaking, in this interview, I won't have been monitoring mm. external stimuli because I'd be listening to what you're saying. But you can do both. You know, I, I, I do both. <laughs> I'm, I'm, you know, we're right now in a, in a conference room in a, skyscraper and i'm looking out at wilshire boulevard on the street right now and i'm thinking i'm thinking about other things but i can also do the other i better up my game i gotta <laughs> I, I gotta be more interesting because you because there's no, i'm looking at this there's nothing interesting out here well no that's not true that's not true but it's you true. know I, you can carry several narratives at the same yes, time. Yes, and part of mindfulness is actually seeing that that's happening. Yeah. And what I find when I'm talking to you or do, or when I'm in the when the chair's reversed and I'm doing an interview and I really want to be focused is that I'm better at letting go of the other stuff that's happening. Right. Because when you don't see it, it actually tends to flourish in ways that uh, are more distracting. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. You know, here in California, people in the cars, I notice that everyone around me is not looking at where they're going. They're they're looking at their phones and that bothers me. That is actually super dangerous. Ha, are the are the number are the st- statistics showing that more there are more accidents now? I don't know, but te- there's no question that texting and driving is incredibly dangerous. Yeah. You should just put in your podcast, listen to that, and keep your eyes on the road. What about barbecuing and driving? Is, is that a thing? Is that a thing? I it, it looks like people are, are barbecuing. They're braiding each other's hair. They're doing their taxes. They're doing all kinds of stuff in these Clipping cars. Clipping their nails. All kinds of stuff. They're ex- everything except driving. Yeah, so I don't live in a, a driving culture. Do you know I live how in to New drive? York City. I do know how to drive. I yeah. grew up in Boston, so I'm a terrible driver. But uh, for, Which they, you saw the st- statistic on that recently about that Boston people drivers? in Massachusetts are the worst drivers. We are the worst drivers. I was a ter- I was a horrible, aggressive driver. But 18 years ago, I moved to New York City, sold my car, haven't driven since. Yeah, you haven't driven since. I mean, I occasionally will drive a car, but I haven't owned a car since. So you guys are in California right now. Um, how are you getting around? Uber or oh, Lyft, Uber. actually. Uh huh. And um, what are you doing in California? Doing a bunch of promotion for this book. And, and the book is called. <laughs> the book is called. <laughs> book is Why called... can't I remember the name of the book? The book is called Meditation for Fidgety Skeptics. And my <laughs> wife came so that we could escape our three year old and hang out and stay at a nice hotel and uh, do some podcasts and see some friends. It's Where's, actually been where is your three year old right now? He's uh, at the apartment. Well, he's probably at school right now. Here in California? No, no, no. Back uh. in New York City. Yeah. Oh, in New York City? Yeah. yeah. What neighborhood do you live in? We I live, live in, in the West airport. Village. Oh, I love the West Village. Where I do you guys it. live? We live in the Upper West Side, but it's, um, it's it's a, it's an inferior neighborhood to the the Upper West, West Side. Was that seventy like seventh? So we used to live on seventy fifth and Riverside, and then we moved down closer to Columbus Circle. Oh, that's nice. Eh, is it? Yeah. Well, yeah. It's okay. Yeah, I um, I, you know what? I I can't imagine. My life in New York, I, I don't know what it would be like to live day in and day out in another neighborhood. You know, so sometimes when I go. I will stay in a hotel just because, like I was, we were in construction for a while. Oh, so you still have the place? Oh yeah, I've had this place since 1995. 1995. When when did that first song come out? That came out in '92. It came out on my birthday. Supermodel, you better work. Came out on November 17th. 1992. So on you my had birthday. some cash to get a nice apartment in 1992. Well, yeah, you know what happened is I. Uh, uh, the record I got a record deal and they gave me um, a certain amount of money to make the album and so as part of that money up front uh, of course you have to recoup that later part of that money up front I was able to live on and uh, get an apartment and all that kind of stuff you know but um, the, the real money really when I got the Mac contract you know the makeup thing that's when I bought that apartment oh okay yeah yeah. I read your book, which is no longer in print, but I read it in. in um, I don't think it's in print anymore. Uh, is it? The the one called um, uh, "Letting It All Hang Out" is not in print. Yeah, that's a shame because it's a really good book. It's fun. It's really fun. But I learned all sorts of things that I did. Oh, I'm sure. And then my book um, "Working It" is is in print. Okay. And I have missed several many things you could learn. From that, book. but I would recommend that pe- I'm sure you can get uh, an out of print copy on Amazon. I-, I would recommend that people read it. It's well, hilarious. you know, I someone showed me you could get an out of print copy of hardback of 
uh, the first one, which is called, I can't remember the name of that one either, uh, uh, letting it all hang out for, I think it was 250 bucks. What? Yes! 250 bucks! I think you're teaching there how to do a tuck. <laughs> I certainly do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it, you know, listen. That's worth 250 bucks. You don't need a degree in from the space laboratory to figure that one out. <laughs> You know, <laughs> doesn't take much. Um, we're going to take a quick break. We've got Dan Harris. He's got a 10 minute meditation something. Meditation made easy for 10 minutes. For what? 10 I'm people, not, meditate in a I'm room. Not, I'm not even going to comment. Yeah. Uh, but go all you have to know is Dan Harris. Yeah. Because you go to Amazon, there are only two books. Yeah. You go to Amazon. Yes. You say Dan Harris. And 50 Shades of Meditation pops right there up. You go. There you Boom. go. Boom. And you and you pick that book up. You get it on your um, <laughs> iPad. You can get it. Do you do the do you read the book yourself? Oh, yeah. yeah you yeah, do sure. the yeah, electronic yeah. version yes. of it. Yes. Why don't you get like someone like, you know, um, uh, Freddie Munez or what was that guy's name on um, Malcolm in the Middle? What was his name? Nunez. You know what would have been really awesome uh, is if I had you read it. Wouldn't that be fabulous? You'd be in there conducting the orchestra. Oh, my goodness. Reading it slow, fast. I'd do certain chapters in Vocal Fry, and then I'd do certain <laughs> chapters in the um, question mark uh, uh, up speak. Uh, what's, it, what's his name? Frankie Munez. Frankie Munez. Say it for me. Frankie Frankie. Munez. Frankie Munoz should have read your book. Is who is should have. I'm sticking with you. Yeah, no. I, or 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 had you gotten all the queens from Drag Race oh, to man. read a chapter yeah, absolutely. from your book? That would be fabulous. And, and let them free associate on it oh too. Just God, take it wherever they it want. Would be so good. This it is would actually be so good. There's something here. Okay, we're gonna take a break, and we're gonna come back with more Dan Harris. You know, Michelle, I'm back to eating healthy again. Oh, yeah. And I'm I'm just so excited. You know, once you eat healthy, uh, fruit becomes sweet. And it's God's candy, child. Yes, and vegetables become so flavorful. Well, That's why that. I'm so excited about Blue Apron. Yes, well, here's the thing with Blue Apron. It's funny that you said eating healthy again because there there are options on Blue Apron that don't have to be healthy. Right. And they're, they're not a lot, but there's the pizzas and the things like that. And But they always actually find a way to throw some broccoli on it sure. and keep it clean. But they're also, um, this new year, they teamed up with Whole30. And Whole30 is how I started my whole health eating movement. Whole30 is a program about eating eating 30 days clean, nothing from a package, oh. nothing. You have to make everything. And it's like a way to start your life getting healthy. And they've teamed up. They've with teamed Blue Apron. up with Whole30, uh, with Blue Apron. Yeah, uh -huh. it's fantastic. Listen, you guys know that I've been blue using Blue Apron for a I've been yes. bluing. Yeah, you've for been For a long time. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. I actually blued last night. Honey, you blew. <laughs> In my way, not my husband's way, because he'd be really happy. But this is actually Blue Apron. They deliver seasonal recipes along with pre-portioned ingredients to make delicious home-cooked meals. You've heard me talk about it. I actually believe in it. And I've tried, let me tell you, at least seven other plans. And I always went back to Blue Apron. Yeah, I love that. The food is so beautiful and it's so fresh. And it's such a great variety of food. Oh, tons of variety. And this week, the Whole30 stuff that they've got coming up, um, our Mexican spice barramundi fish with avocado. Mm. Uh, tor, I'm going to say it wrong. Togarashi chicken lettuce cups with avocado. So you don't have to worry about the bread. Mm -hmm. You put the chicken in the lettuce cups, you know, like in and out, do with the protein oh, yeah, burger. Yeah, 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 yeah. Exactly. So kickstart your new year with Blue Apron and Whole30. There's tons of variety. They're very flexible. And like I say, easy. That is the key because a lot of times I'm out of, I'm out of the house. I'm not here. Sure. And my husband is not a cook. He cooks full healthy meals for my kids with Blue Apron. And I, I just love that it takes the guesswork out of it because, you know, if you if you don't know your way around a grocery store, uh, it can be very a very daunting task it to is. go out and look Overwhelming. for food. Overwhelming. Overwhelming. Yeah. But the food gets sent to your house regularly and it's fresh. Done. Mm -hmm. Completely pre -po Sometimes all you need is salt and pepper. Really? And some olive oil, whatever you cook with. Yeah, mm. it's that easy. Get $30 off your first meal with free shipping by going to blueapron.com slash rue. That's blueapron.com slash ru. I'm telling you guys, as much as we talk about the other things you're going to love, when you do this, mm -hmm. you're never going to look back. So I suspect I'm going to get a lot in, in 2018, a lot more tweets about this one. Blue Apron, a better way to cook. We've got Dan Harris here. We're talking about meditation. We're talking about all kinds of things. But he's got uh, two books. The, the, the current book is, um, here we go. is called here we um, go. Meditation for People Who Don't Have a Lot of Time. And, and it's, they're skeptical nope, about meditation. That's not what it's called. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. No, that was adorable. I mean, you were close. Yeah. You were in the neighborhood. 
You know, I'm good with two like two word titles yeah. or one word titles. Yes, but my my first book has like two words and you couldn't get that yeah, either. It was something Just, about 10 minutes. Yeah, ten, nope, nope, it wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> One more time. Once, okay, and I won't get it, but yeah. just for the people at home, uh, the first book is called Catcher in the Rye. Yeah. Second book <laughs> is For Whom the Bell Tolls. <laughs> oh my God. Yeah, it's funny you say, because you know, I, I, I may have told you this, you know, I play dirty charades all the time where you take a, a title of a book or something and you just change one word of the title, and but you cannot change the syllables. You change one word yeah. of the title. But you cannot change the syllables. And I was watching Jeopardy, and they said, "They said, um, uh, uh, for whom the bell tolls." I thought, oh, "I got it. I got the dirty charades of for whom the bell to- tolls." Right? Um, you can't. You can't guess what I how I change this. I don't want to get you in trouble. I know you have a, a no, no, probably no, no. a morality clause with no, ABC no. This fine. Disney. I hear it. Now I'm really curious. Uh, uh, I got. I still come up. With, oh yes, I did. I do have one for um, uh, a catcher in the, catcher in the rye. <laughs> it's um, for whom the bell tolls is for skin the bell tolls. <laughs> That's my dirty charades for that book. <laughs> and then catch a catch. It's called a catcher in the rye, isn't it? I don't it's remember. Just catcher in the rye. I don't know. Yeah, catcher in the I eye. Mean, I wrote it. I okay. Catcher, catcher in the eye. <laughs> <laughs> I gotta come up with a dirty charade for your book if I knew the title. Yeah, yeah. I mean that—that that is a prerequisite. Okay, so so tell me, just tell me what the title is. <laughs> first, what your the, the first, first book was ten percent happier. Ten percent. Okay, yeah. so let's get this. Okay, ten percent happier. Ten. A bit. Uh, 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 yeah, because I can't change the the the, the um, syllables of scent, so it would be ten inch happier. <laughs> I just want to say these are the views of RuPaul, yes, not right. of Dan not Harris. Not of ABC yes. or Disney or any of the affiliates. And it was a pleasure to work at ABC News for 18 years. It was a great career. What's the second book called? Uh, Meditation for Fidgety Skeptics. Uh, well, that's dirty already. <laughs> <laughs> I don't need to do a thing with that. That's already... <laughs> really dirty, my God! So I mean, you've got this kid. Um, do you know who the father is? <laughs> well, he's really good looking, so I suspect it's some milkman blood in there. Okay. I don't know. When do you think he was he... made in a lab? So it could have been a mistake. Okay. Yeah. Um, when is a good time to teach a kid how to meditate? You know, they say that you can do it in preschool. He's in preschool now, but it's also true. I've spoken to some experts about this. It may also be true in some cases that the parents are not necessarily the right people to do it Uh because kids are often much more rebellious with their parents. So teachers teaching in preschool seems to work. There was one study that taught kids how to do something called compassion meditation, which um, is a bi- basically a way to teach anybody who does that kind of meditation to have more compassion. And those kids, preschoolers, were more likely to give their stickers away to kids they didn't know. Uh huh. I so love that. So it can that. affect behavior. You know, that's smart because you know when you have a kid and you you think, what can I do for this person in the world? How can I send them out there with armed with what they're going to need? to navigate this life and i think okay you um you want to teach them kindness you want to teach them how to swim you want to teach them how to uh to 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 process ideas and feelings and and the the place the space they take up in this world so, and meditation is a perfect place to start with this absolutely right i mean i actually have some really strong feelings about this we teach kids a lot of important things you know state capitals and all that stuff but pretty much nothing about their inner landscape right and how to have what's called emotional intelligence yeah so we have emotions we may not want to look at them we all have emotions it's part of being alive you either see them clearly and and surf them in a supple way or you're owned by them and we can teach kids really early how to do that 
also, again, back to the two benefits that I discussed before. There's mindfulness, which is sort of an emotional agility, if you will. And then the second is focus. And if you want to get kids who are, can pay attention and study and do the work they need to do in order to succeed, meditation is a great way to do that. Yeah. In fact, I know that you, uh, you follow Eckhart Tolle and actually well, in um, – well, the restraining <clears throat> order is taking care of that. Uh, <laughs> the um, – there's a, um, in a chapter in A New Earth that talks about children. It talks about how to introduce mindfulness to children and how to uh, help them understand their emotions. You know, uh, by even um, when they get angry, you know, calling that, that feeling a name and saying, yeah. did, uh, you know, did, uh, you know, this, uh, calling it like, say, Fred, did Fred show up today? It's like, yeah, Fred is feeling, you know, I, I, I don't know if that's too confusing for a kid, but it seems, uh, seems like it, it, it could actually help. I think it works for grownups. In fact, in the course of writing this book, uh, my co-author, this guy, Jeff Warren, who's this meditation teacher from Toronto, he and I, basically the, the conceit of the book is we wanted to go across the country in this big, silly orange bus that was previously occupied by Parliament Funkadelic. Hot! Hot. The mothership! We were the most boring people who ever stepped foot on the bus. Wow. And so we, we went across the country, we met all sorts of people, cops, social workers. Just film it. Oh, everything. Oh, good. And because uh, it doesn't exist unless there's a camera there. Oh, fact. Yeah. yeah. Hashtag fact. Uh huh. So uh, we then, uh, in the course of uh, meeting these people, we figured out what's stopping them from meditating, and we help them get over the hump. And that's what the book does. It teaches you how to meditate, and also sort of figures out what are the major obstacles and helps you get over them. Jeff, in sitting in this little tin can with Jeff, going across the country over the course of eleven days, diagnosed some issues in me. Uh, which we talk about in the book. And one of them was that my meditation practice had a kind of grim death march quality to it. And mm -hmm. part of it was that I was really hard on myself. Every, I always tell people, you know, when you get distracted in meditation, that is not a failure, it's a win. Mm -hmm. But I wasn't doing that in my own practice. Mm -hmm. And Jeff said, you know, you should notice that you have this kind of inner anger, mm -hmm. self-directed and other-directed. And he's like, you should just give it a name and kind of make a ah. joke about it so that, or make it lighter so that you aren't taking it so seriously. So I ended up naming Anger Robert Johnson, who is the name, which is the name of my grandfather who's no longer with us, who is a pretty angry, uh, unpleasant human being. And so now when Anger comes up, I'm like, what's up, Robert? Uh huh. How you doing? Robert Johnson not here today. Where, <laughs> where Robert Johnson at? <laughs> That's uh, it's interesting. No, that's you know, perfect. If I could give Robert that voice, uh -huh. it would be much better. Where Robert Johnson at? <laughs> uh, and that's that's really interesting and, and sort of compartmentalizing uh, the things that come up. Wh where do you think this anger then comes from? Wh why? Why? Where's the taskmaster? Who in your background? Is your mother, your father? Who's the taskmaster? Uh, Where'd you learn that? You know, the th the mind is a mystery like we, w one thing we just do not know is where do thoughts and feelings come from they come out of a void and we spend a lot of time holding ourselves responsible for our feelings and our thoughts when in fact we can't control what comes up we can control how we deal with it mm -hmm. and so uh, you know where does my robert come from i think it comes from robert himself mm -hmm. um my parents are actually super genial um and neither of them, you know, we had a really good relationship growing up. So it's not like I had some, I had actually, I would say, in fact, maybe this is it. I was a spoiled kid. So some of my anger may result in not getting what I want mm. in the world when I did as a kid. Mm -hmm. um, but the point is, whatever comes up for you, you don't need to blame yourself for it. You're not responsible for it. What you can hold yourself responsible for is how you manage it. Mm -hmm. And so coming up with little cute little nicknames for so for me i've got an inner i got inner anger i've got an inner planner i've got an inner super ambitious person type a it's you know always kind of scheming to, to get ahead in my career i've got is that one called skunk edda uh, <laughs> skunk edda that's better i call him sammy because there was a book called uh, what makes sammy run uh -huh. about a hollywood uh executive who was really slimy huh. so that's what i call my huh. but skunk edda is better well no it's just it's interesting learning these hacks and these tricks to, <clears throat> to navigate this life and yes. it's just uh uh because i think everyone thinks of themselves the ego force uh, sort of makes people think that uh it's all it's all one voice and it's all coming from this one place but when i meditate and i see myself and i see uh certain actions that i take i, I can see that kid that yeah. kid of who um 
who felt left behind and uh, is, is now acting out because of, uh, for whatever reason, you know, and, and a lot, through 12 step programs, I've learned, uh, you know, when some, some of those voices come up. I can, I can say, thanks for sharing Skunketa, but we are not doing that today. Uh, Robert brilliant. Johnson, you need to take a seat because <laughs> we are not there to dare, you know. I would love to have seen Robert Johnson interact with you. Yeah, well, you know, that would bring out my inner skunketa, <laughs> and they would have to go toe-to-toe, head-to-head, you know, which and nobody wins. Nobody wins in that situation. Well, you know? actually, you might have had a positive effect on him, and he mellowed by the, time, by the end of his life, so— Maybe he because Bianca, uh, my wife, when she only knows him as a kind of genial older man. Ah. Um, oh, you're talking about not the your inner saboteur, Robert Johns. You're talking about the real, the real Robert, your John. grandfather. Yes, I just don't know how he would yeah. compute RuPaul. That would be a very interesting. Well, it'd be interesting. You know, I've learned yeah. little hacks myself in my life to um, sort of, um, you know, as the diplomat that I am, to sort of try to win people over. Some people are not to be won over, you know. But uh, you know, I've. I've I've been able to introduce drag to a, 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 a skeptical world who thought of it as nothing but, you know, subversion. I think actually that it was a titanic. Um, uh, um, that was a towering cultural achievement to do that, mm. and I think it created a lot of open mindedness in the culture where it wasn't. And you were talking about this stuff at a time when the culture was not super open to it, and not right. super open even to sort of discussions of gender. Uh, in the same way we are to think about it, you, you know, you were, your song came out in, in 1992. Two, yes. So <clears throat> even as late as the year 2000, if you had told somebody gay marriage might be coming down the road, they would have told you you're smoking. That's you're true. Much way more than waking and baking. That's true. But that's not to say that it's always going to stay there because, you know, uh, the way things progress in our culture, we always think of it as linear. And then once we get up there, it'll stay there. It's like, no, no, it's, it's sideways. It's it's, uh, you know, progress is uh, goes a lot of different places. That's you know? a very important point. And, and that's why vigilance is important. There's no now, question about it. Uh, we're going to take a break. But when we come back, I want to ask you about living in Maine. And did you ever go to Cabot Cove? or meet Jessica Fletcher from Murder, She Wrote. <laughs> so I know you spent time in Maine, so I, I just want to find out about that. I did, that. sure. I'm happy um, to share. We're going to take a break. We'll be back with more Dan Harris. Girl, Squarespace is setting the world on fire, honey. <laughs> they have re- revolutionized the act of creating a website, which used to be, by the way, really difficult. I think they, you mean revolutionize. Revolutionize it. <laughs> Remember back in the day, you had to hire a webmaster, and then you had to be in contact with them all the time. Well, those days are gone. I honestly, I hated being like a slave to the my yeah. webmaster. All for right, lack Grace of, Jones. Oh, lack of a better term, <laughs> slave. To the, to the website, to the webmaster. Yes, it just. I told you. I told you my story. I paid so much money for this website, yeah. and the opening page looked pretty. And then I was like, "Oh, you know, you put the instead of and, and I need to change that." He's like, "Okay, one hundred fifty dollars." Oh my goodness! And I was like, "Bitch, no." <laughs> <laughs> and I would fight with the guy. It just didn't work out and end up being canceled. But not, you know, I had to bring it down. Yeah. But not with Squarespace. That's what it's all about. And by the way, we get some great emails at RuPaulPodcast at gmail.com about your Squarespace websites. And I've got a letter here today, Ru. Uh, hello from the City of Champions, Pittsburgh, PA. Um, to state things plainly, I simply want to say thank you both for your insights shared on What's the Tea, especially since that dark orange cloud has hovered over our heads since November 2016. <laughs> <laughs> Through discussions with your guests and perhaps even more when it's just the two of you, I've gained perspective, confidence, and even a degree of wisdom through the candid nature of the conversations. And I can only assume this holds true for countless others as well. In fact, I've gotten my sommelier certification. Oh, bottle, bottles up. Bottles up, yeah. honey. Pour one out for the homies. And thanks to your Squarespace discount code, launched my very own website, Burgundy, couldn't resist a good pun, y'all, uh-huh. to write about wine and advertise my wine-related services. It's Burgundy with an H. Okay. B-U-R-G-H-U-N-D-Y oh, dot like com. Pittsburgh. Correct. Okay. Get the pun? Yeah. It's still in its infancy, but it's already gotten the attention of some of my favorite wine producers, and I'm excited about what the future holds. Wishing you a holiday season full of joy, rest, and rejuvenation. Warm regards from Adam Noser. I'm going to guess same okay. his name is. Yeah. So thank you for that, Adam, and congrats on your sommelier uh, license. That's great. Yeah. I, I Wouldn't you just be sort of tempted to just drink wine all the time? You think he does it? <laughs> 
<laughs> you think who needs coffee? I you wonder, can have a Pinot. Yeah, I wonder if he does it on his website. You know, uh, if you really want to find out about someone, you can look at their web- website because you get a sense of who they are and what their aesthetic is. Totally. Yeah. Amen to that. And you guys can get a free trial to Squarespace today. No credit card required. Just go to squarespace.com. And when you're blown away and ready to confirm that plan, you know what you have to do. Use the offer code RU and get 10% off and you'll be getting a great deal. And you know that. Our friends at Squarespace have been with us since day one. We are so grateful to them and we love the product. So keep sending your emails to rupaulpodcast at gmail.com. That's squarespace.com. Offer code RU. I always ask everyone about Murder, She Sat Down and She Wrote. Now, we talked about the Golden Girls earlier. Have you ever watched Murder, She Sat Down and She Wrote? Your your whole cultural sort of frame of reference is... is yeah, you're so much 80s, younger. Early... No, it's not It's not an age thing. I'm not that much younger than you. I'm just like, I, I, I let it go. You know what I mean? Like... But see, these are things that are on TV right now. Murder, She Sat Down and She Wrote is on TV every day right now. And, you know. But there's a lot of stuff on TV that is on right now that I don't watch. watch It's not about time. I would say it's more. Yeah, so you're watching Dave Chappelle. Have, by the way, have, have you watched his his comedy specials? Are you also a fan of his comedy specials, which are on Netflix? I say I'm going to be honest. I haven't seen the two newest ones two that new just ones. dropped. Right. I saw the two ones that dropped before that. I thought they were good, but not at it's, the level of right. what he was doing. <clears throat> in the, in right. Because that show was next level shit. That that the Chappelle show was beyond. It was. It was as as one of his characters said in the show. It was spitting hot fire. <laughs> It's great. It's great. So you went to college in Maine. I did. Did you take any? Did, did Jessica Fletcher teach any of your courses <laughs> at the college? Not that I'm aware of. <laughs> right. Although there was a lot of there were a lot of hallucinogenic drugs, so she could have been conjured, uh, you know, on many different occasions right. that I missed. Right. Now Bianca, Bianca, Dan's wife is here. Uh, you know, you don't have a microphone, but I'll I'll speak for you. Do you watch Murder She Sat Down and She Wrote? Have you seen it? <laughs> 20 years ago. Right, right. I just don't know what's wrong with you people, honestly, because it is. No, I'm joking. <clears throat> no, it's a great show. I love it so much. And, and uh, you know, Golden Girls. Bianca, when was the last time you saw Golden Girls? <clears throat> I actually did a drive-by the other day. Oh, really? So, uh, okay. Okay, good. You shouldn't admit that publicly. No, 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 no. <laughs> no, the Golden Girls is is bar. I'm kidding. Actually, yes. it's very, very funny. I'm yeah. actually just kidding. It's it's uh, so good. So, all right. So, um, we're talking about meditation. We're talking about your books and your life as a a broadcaster. This is everything you've always wanted to do, isn't That's it? That's absolutely right. Yes, and that you asked me before, how do I get it all done? I think the problem is I have uh, I'm have this situation where I get to do all the things I've always wanted to do and I'm a little bit like a kid in the candy store trying to do too many things and yeah. Bianca and I talk about this a lot how do we manage all these opportunities that I have and things that I want to do I love my day job at ABC yeah. I love my side hustle and as being a meditation proponent yeah. I love having a podcast I love having a kid I love having a wife I love it all uh-huh. so and I like watching TV just not murder she sat down and she wrote yeah. so yeah. um it's just a matter of figuring it out day to day but I am in a very lucky position and I try not to forget that yeah it's easy to complain yeah do you ever have nightmares about being in Iraq or or Afghanistan I mean you were literally on the front line of war my problem with being in the war zone was not that it was traumatic my problem was that I liked it what did you like about it it's like putting your finger in an electric socket of thrill it's uh it's just so exciting you're doing the job you've always loved but now you are um, doing it in such a high stakes environment. It's so important. The whole world is watching. And then at the end of the day, after going out and covering all of these incredible things, you get to go on television and talk about it. Mm-hmm. There's an expression, there's nothing more thrilling than the bullet that misses you. Uh-huh. And luckily for me, they all missed. <clears throat> that was not true for a lot of people I, I knew and know, many of whom got hurt or didn't make it. But it was just a thrilling time, and I what came, well, pr- the problem for me was I came home and got depressed because I was withdrawing from the adrenaline, and that kind of led to some very dumb behavior in my yeah, life. Yeah, yeah. So, um, who would play you in the in the uh, Netflix version of your your life, either the books or in the other book, your autobiography book, or the book that your son writes, uh, the tell all book that your son will eventually I'm write? Just, you know, I keep seeing, you know, maybe. 
I keep seeing Chris Hemsworth, you know? Okay. All right. I hear you. Right on. I, I just, I mean, you guys can't see me, but <clears throat> there's not a passing resemblance to Thor, let's just say. Well, you know. Which Hemsworth is Thor? It's Chris? Yeah, it's, yeah. it's Chris. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. But, yeah, you know, it's interesting. I mean, because you, you've lived such an incredible life already, and you're a relatively young man. You really are. And uh, uh, it's a lot, a lot of stuff. I mean, the ups and the downs, and I was... I, you know, I got to see that clip of you, uh, uh, you know, uh, the, 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 what you call the most embarrassing moment on television when you uh, you had an episode on live television, yeah. which, you know, when you look at it, I, you know, initially I didn't want to see it because I never see, I never want to see someone being sabotaged. I never want to see like a practical joke on someone. So I, 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 I it took me a long time to go, okay, I'm going to watch, but I watched it in the context of you reporting about it after the fact yes, that's the only yeah, way i could do it yeah but uh uh because i knew somehow i could beat you could walk me through it and i wouldn't feel bad about it you know what i mean um when you think about that what goes through your head when you think about that episode so i had a panic just for people who haven't seen it although it's pretty widely viewed on youtube these days i had a panic attack on national television on good morning america in 2004 uh so not long after i came home from iraq and I had gotten home from Iraq after having spent many years after having spent many years in Pakistan and Afghanistan and Israel and the West Bank, Gaza and Iraq. And then I got depressed because I was withdrawing from the adrenaline. I didn't know I was depressed because I was mindless. And then I did this incredibly stupid thing of self-medicating with cocaine and ecstasy. And even though I wasn't um, doing it all the time and I wasn't doing it when I was working, my doctor later explained to me after the panic attack that it, it artificially raised the level of adrenaline in my brain and made it much more likely that I would freak out on the air. Hmm. So that happened in like 2004. And, you know, people, I get one of two responses. One response is, and you kind of hinted at this in what you were saying a minute ago, that it doesn't look that bad. Mm -hmm. So many people say, yeah, it doesn't look that bad. Others, anybody who's ever actually had a taste of panic will know exactly what they're looking at because, mm -hmm. you know, you can mm -hmm. see the terror in my eyes mm -hmm. if you look. And if you've ever had that feeling, you know what to look for. Um, luckily, there are plenty of people who haven't had that feeling. But yeah. I got away with it because, uh, in other words, my career didn't end that day because I was able to hold it together reasonably well. Right. And because you were taking the cocaine anally. <laughs> <laughs> which is a, a note to self. Uh, no, I'm joking. Um, the uh, yeah, no, I, I, it, it doesn't look that bad actually on on camera. It doesn't look that. I, you can see the in your eyes. You're absolutely right. Why is it called a panic attack? Because what happens is it looks like you lose your place, and you could see your your brain thinking. You could you're, you're seeing yourself thinking i lost my place why, why is that called a panic attack so a panic attack is is essentially the fight or flight um uh response mm -hmm. so fight or flight response is this ancient response that we evolved from when we we're faced with like a saber-toothed tiger right. you either fight or you run and in that fight or flight response your brain and your body's flooded with uh adrenaline and um then your you you your heart rate speeds up and uh, you can get short of breath. There are evolutionary. Had reasons. you ever had one before? I'd had minor versions of them before. Mm -hmm. I would say I'm at baseline an anxious person, mm -hmm. so had struggled. I mean, I made a joke in my first book that my career represented a triumph of narcissism over fear mm -hmm. because I had long struggled with stage fright, but I so badly wanted to be on TV and loved journalism that I stayed in the game. So I knew what was happening when it started to happen, but I never had it this strong, so strong that I had to quit in the middle of my newscast and throw it back to the other hosts of the show. That Nothing like that had ever happened to me before. And the reason why I was so bad this time was that my I had in my bloodstream cocaine, which right. is like a synthetic squirt of adrenaline and, and makes you more likely to have panic attacks that are worse. Yeah. What happened immediately after that episode? People in the studio and in the control room asked me, were very concerned. They're like, what's the matter? And I lied. I said, I don't know. Even mm -hmm. though I definitely knew. Mm -hmm. um, and so I kind of got away with it because the next hour I had to come back on TV and I was able to get through that. Yeah. But I, en I ended up going to see a shrink, mm -hmm. and I didn't know why I'd had the panic attack. And he asked me a bunch of questions to try to figure out 
what was the problem? And one of the questions was, do you do drugs? Mm -hmm. And when I told him yes, he said, okay, asshole, mystery solved. And he didn't ask you whether it was uh, anally or, or orally. Or freebasing. Oh, no, free none of that. He didn't right. ask that. Yeah. Um, so, <laughs> now, we we're talking earlier. I'm, I go all over the place. You want to talk about non sequiturs and, and David. I love it. And Bring I it. speak that language very well. Um, uh, for people who want to get into meditation, aside from going to Amazon and picking up your your book, the 10 minute, 10 minute egg in less than an hour. And um, <laughs> I know there's a 10. There's a 10 in the first title. And then the second one is something about fidgety, fidgety yeah. people. Yes. Meditation for fidgety people. Some enterprising person is going to hear this podcast, write a book called 10 Inch Happier and make a ton of money. <laughs> But you know, you know what, you know, people, you know, you, you you pick, you know, I'm an artistic person, so I see images, and I I like a twist of a phrase, and if there are too many straight up words that mean straight up language, I, my brain gets bored in the middle of the sentence and goes, I have I have no idea what that means. Uh, but the um, but if you're again, if your book if your book was called um, Shaka Khan, <laughs> I would know. What it the title of it. all your cultural references come from the same time period. It, Shaka it, Khan was hot so right. when Murder it, She Wrote was hot. You're absolutely right. And and Golden Girls. And, yes, and Golden it was Girls. all the same time. It's all the same time. But you know, uh, can I can I think of, of a, a cultural reference from today that's as interesting as that? Vocal fry. Well, I don't think it's <clears throat> that's interesting. I think of um. Uh, I think Little Kim, but that's that's still that's nineties. That's twenty years ago. I'm getting I'm getting yeah, up there slowly. Uh, it's just the, there's nobody like it. who's who's making music today that you like. Um, uh, you know what? I, this uh, my favorite album from uh, oh a few years ago was Kaiza. Um, she had that song called Hideaway, that was um, it was a return to nineties house music. Kaiza. Uh, she, yeah, she had it, Video. I can't play. I have my phone right here. Anyway, I can play for you. Anyway, um, what am I listening to today? You ask. Yes. Um, uh, probably, um, probably um, Liza Minnelli's album from the eighties, <laughs> uh, the Results album with the Pet Shop Boys. Have you ever heard? That? What are you listening to? Uh, I listen to a whole mix of things. I listen to a lot of indie rock. I also listen to a lot of Beatles with my son because he likes the Beatles. Uh. I listen to some hip hop. Um, I wouldn't call myself an expert. Yeah. I like Schoolboy Q. I like um, Kendrick Lamar. Huh. I like Vince Staples. He's an L.A. guy. I've never heard. Of, I, I've heard of Kendrick Lamar. I've never heard his music before. He's really good. He's huh. really talented. Everybody. And I, I mean, think he's into meditation. He's he's rapped about it. Huh. And well, everybody talks about Kendrick Lamar. Kendrick he, he, Lamar. Yeah. Just, you know. He's incredibly skilled. There's so much stuff out there. You know, how are you going to? I know, just, to just wrap yourself up in Liza Minnelli and the Golden Girls yeah. and you're good. Yeah, you know, exactly. I'm going to accept that as who I am, what I'm about. Murder, she sat down and she wrote. And, <laughs> you know, call Robert Johnson and say, I ain't got no time for you. <laughs> <laughs> well, Dan Harris, you, it's always a joy to talk to you. Likewise. You're just lovely. And as I, are you. And it's such an interesting uh storyline that that you would being the seeker would find meditation like this and find something that uh, help, makes it work for you in this high-paced world of information which i can't even imagine what that's like all the stuff you have to think about uh and that you found meditation and that you're sharing your experience with the world that's that's the true sign of a gentleman i do my best Thank Gracious. You. Thank you so much Thank for you. being with us. Really fun. And we'll keep this conversation going. I hope so. And if um, if you see a 10-inch happier book out there, you know. It's, you wrote it. Oh, yeah. That's right. That's right. You'll be, <laughs> you'll be hearing from my attorney. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Appreciate it. Can I get an amen? Can I get an amen? If you can't love yourself. How in the hell you gonna love somebody else? Can I get an amen? And don't forget to subscribe on iTunes. If you can't love yourself, how in the hell you gonna love somebody else? Amen.